regular um, Nelson Police Board meeting. We would like to acknowledge that the land on which we gather is the traditional territory of the Tanaha, the Silics and the Sinex people, and is home to the Métis and many diverse Aboriginal persons. We honour their connection to the land and rivers and respect the importance of the environment to our strength as a community. And can I have a motion to accept the consent agenda as presented? Moved and seconded. All those in favor? And that carries. And starting right off with an exciting opportunity here. And it gives me a lot of pleasure to ask, um, I'm sorry, Constable Hillward. Hill. Drew. Two works. <laughs> <laughs> right. Stuck right into the room if he can manage to get those broad shoulders through those skinny city doors. <laughs> and so I'm just going to read this because for the recording and for everybody to know is that each year the BCACP and ICBC on a select BC police officers for their enforcement of distracted driving related charges with a certificate and a challenge coin. BC Highway Patrol coordinates the process and produces the certificates while ICBC provides the data and produces the challenge coins. Distracted driving is the second leading cause of fatal collisions in BC, representing approximately 25% of all fatal crashes in the province. These awards are one method of thanking our officers for their dedication, the enforcement of distracted driving, and helping to keep our roads and highways safer. And so, um, Drew has, is winning the Silver Award, which means that he has presented between 152 and 243 violation tickets in the last year. So he's going to get this lovely award. And that way, that way, yeah. be on TV. How do we get through on TV so everybody can see who it is that's getting the award? Oh, yeah, you come up here. Okay. That's it. Okay. That's how we do it. And then, yeah. So... <laughs> Um, and this comes from the superintendent, Holly um, Turin, who wants to say that as the officer in charge of the BC Highway Patrols and co-chairs co of the BCACPC Traffic Safety Committee, I want to take the opportunity to thank you um, for supporting members in this worthwhile endeavor as we work towards improving road safety. And she extends her heartfelt thanks to all award recipients. Thank you. So... And I'm I'm really happy to give this out. I uh, I'll tell you a story one time about my my past and my involvement with um, drivers education. But uh, there you go. So there and then your challenge coin. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> so we need to get you to I don't know. I don't think it would take that long, but the award. The, the so, award of excellence. Yes, we should probably get one. Can you want to take off the chief? Get the chief in. The, um, a little bit more work. Can you hold this like this. Okay. There you go. <laughs> uh, you've done this once or twice. <laughs> <laughs> you guys are experts. <laughs> you know, I do the head bad hands over. There you go. Thank you, <laughs> you just have to get up to um, uh, four hundred and twenty-two violation tickets. Okay. <laughs> so Hopefully, that right. there's not I that many. Yeah, two, 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 two forty-one. Two forty. <laughs> no, two. The the award of excellence oh. mm -hmm. is four hundred and twenty-two. Top. The top one. So I, I would say you've been busy. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but uh, great. 152 to 243. That's fantastic. So, yeah, Everybody thank agrees you. to be understanding when he has to give you a ticket, though. It's just because he's trying. He's to trying to get. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. And congratulations. Thank you. Thanks, Drew. I'm just sort of thinking. That I wonder if your council will start giving out some of those um, e-bikers e e e because I've got to say that there's. A few of them that are going much faster than they'll post the speed limits in the city. <laughs> and the other day, as somebody was going down my hill, and I could just hear it, um, was reading his uh, cell phone while also wearing no helmet. You're on that block of carbonate. Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, exactly. I'm on that block of carbonate. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> so, moving on. Oh. Gosh, yeah, when we come by and then. Mm -hmm. The, because uh, do we con consider that a, a, do we consider the e-bike a vehicle? Does that fall under the yeah, Vehicle Act? Is there, or is that kind of a, 
gray area. Kind of gray, but technically it's about a boulder. Yeah, but the human being is supposed to sort of be in the boulder. Yeah, sort of thinking that there's a lot of distracted cycling going on. So we're at item number four, and that is uh, public participation. So it'd be great if anybody, um, Storm, if you have anything that you'd uh, like to say or. Um, no, I don't at the moment. I guess I could mention I am I'm Storm. I'm from 1035 Bridge. I took Justin Baumgartner's job. So uh, you'll be seeing lots more of me. It's very nice to meet everybody. Um, this is my first one, so I don't have any any questions or anything at the moment. But thank you for giving me the opportunity. Right. Thanks for being Storm. And Angus, you're there in the corner. Is there anything that uh, so we, it's broad broad interests of the general public, if you have anything you'd like to say in our public participation time. No, I, I'm, a, I'm a satisfied citizen. <laughs> well, that's, hey. that's important to say that's too. Important to hear. <laughs> that's important to say as well. Mm -hmm. Okay. And, I, and, a, and an appreciative one too. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And then moving on to item number five, um, business arising from the previous meeting, uh, uh, the Equality, Diversity and Inclusion Committee update. And I apologize, I can't get into my file. So if somebody would like to. Um, there doesn't seem to be a file attached yeah. to this. Okay. Yeah. Does anybody want to give a verbal report that's on that committee? Yeah. Well, we did the indigenous blanket exercise yesterday. Um, otherwise, we have a committee meeting coming up, which went very well, actually. Um, it was very impactful. It was my first time participating in it, and I found it. Uh, be very enlightening and educating for myself. I think the majority of the group, and actually everybody in the group is the same, same type of feeling. And we have an agreed diversity committee meeting coming up uh, next Wednesday. Okay. And just talking about the blanket exercise, um, uh, Lena, you were there and um, you were there. Devin, any comments or anything that you'd like to add? First. <laughs> still chewing. Well, that was my second experience, and uh, my first one was some some years ago, and I found it to be very impactful. And um, I have certainly, um, you know, I take pride in saying that was happening because finally somebody heard me repeating it over and over again. And uh, yeah, and it it was just it just brought things back. It, it's uh, it's something that people should take in terms of. Just helping you raise your own consciousness. So it's a very personal journey. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate having that opportunity. Yeah, I think I kind of said in my debrief yesterday during the, the post uh, exercise um, talk, but you know, it's like one thing to kind of understand intellectually um, Canada's history with Indigenous people, but to like, it was a it was a much more like visceral experience, like being moved around and having the timeline like what was happening to indigenous people in Canada, you know, like as it was, like it was really, it was, yeah, it was just really like uh, it, the emotion part of my brain, you know, like it was just, yeah, it, it was, I think really important. And I can't believe it saved me this long to actually be doing. Um, and yeah, I'd like to see, it would it would be great to make sure that we're like like to offer that again in the future for staff and and uh uh because i think it is really important no yeah, thank you and i've done it i to go home last night again four or five times i've done blanket exercise through different things that i'm in, involved with and every time um i think every time for me is actually more emotional uh because there's just more triggers that that I see and that I see within the um, community. And I also think of other populations, not just the, the indigenous um, populations that have had discrimination and other things that have gone on, but it's just the fact that we need to continue to do um, so much work. Is sometimes it's like also that feeling, that tidal wave of overwhelmingness of like, how, how can we ever get it fixed? But it's important that, again, I'll say, what I said yesterday, and that is that you have to know the truth before you can have reconciliation. So if you need to know the history, um, I'm a big advocate that we shouldn't be rewriting history or destroying history. 
we have to acknowledge history and we have to use it as a tool to be able to move forward if we expect to have reconciliation um, with any community and particularly in the Indigenous community in Canada. Charlotte, you were there. I think it was your first, if you'd like, if you want to say anything. Well, the same. It was very emotional for me. It was saying, I, I expected it to be a history lesson, but I didn't expect it to be so powerful and moving. So yeah, I enjoyed it. And I want to do it again, just so I can listen to the words more mm -hmm. versus the movement of people. So, yeah. yeah, And it's also that who tells the history. Yes. We've had history in class. Yes. Yeah. Yes. It's not that history. So not that history. Yes. Not I think that's the most the important piece is that, you know, who writes history? The conquerors or the people who have been oppressed? Mm -hmm. Chief, any last words? No, I well echo those sentiments. I I've been to a couple too, and same thing. I, I'm kind of looking forward to helping promote it and organize the next one and try and get it, uh, you know, try and get it put on again before we go through another year or two. It'd be nice to get another one on maybe in the summer if there's enough people around, but by the fall for sure. So I, I just think it's worth it. And I, I, I don't think people realize what they're missing out until they go and do it. For sure. Anyways, it was very well attended um, yesterday, so, and it was very well presented. Um, moving on then to the Chief Constable's uh, report, financial update. Okay, so there's a few areas where the budget is trending over, if you look through it. Um, there's, there's a couple of different reasons for that. So some of the areas are due to unexpected increases that uh, you know, weren't necessarily budgeted for, but uh, we you know, back in our discussion about the GIBC that seems to keep offering sort of a lesser of a service that the departments are getting more and more responsible for augmenting the training, but the prices keep going up. So there has been a significant increase this year or, or uh, per uh, recruit that goes there. And uh, of course, it would be this year that we plan to send three. So it's going to have a fairly significant impact on the budget. Uh, just with shortages and that over time, again, is is running a bit higher. Um, we'll get into it when this, we get to the staffing updates, but uh, we are making some progress in hiring. Uh, uh, there's another. There's another couple of categories that are are high when you look at the percentages, but that's just because those costs, they're annual costs and they show up early in the year. So we've expended most of those costs early in the year, but they won't go up anymore. So they'll eventually normalize throughout the year as we as the percentages catch up to that time of the year. Uh, as well, seasonal costs. So the building, some of the building costs are a bit high, but a lot of those are due to utilities, the electricity and the gas, and uh, they're usually high at the start of the year. They're low, obviously, through the spring, summer, and fall, and they have a little bit of a spike at the end, but it, it balances out throughout the year. Uh, another unbudgeted cost was for the uh, BPD SISM team, so the critical incident team that came up after the, uh, the avalanche and the tragic death of the two officers. That ended up being a fairly significant cost, but I also think it was an essential service that we provided. And I think there was a lot of uh, a lot of value in bringing them up. Um, the service was taken advantage of by quite a few members, and I, I think uh, we're the better for it. We haven't had anybody that's been off with any kind of ongoing trauma or issues or concerns that were the result of that. So. Good thing to do. I'm glad we did it, but when we got the bill, it was a bit of a yikes. Um, the investigative and uh, well, the investigative section is high, but that's uh, due to again transcription costs that just seem to be uh, extensive every year, and uh, they're they're not going to go anywhere but up. So uh, that's probably something I'll have to have a little more discussion with Chris and Amy on for next year's budget. And then the last bit of, uh, of the BPD WhatsApp investigation, the bills for that came in for the first part of the, the year. So 
that investigation essentially is done. There, there may be a few more costs, but again, out of our realm and out of our control. So uh, between travel and they had a lot of transcription costs, and investigative costs that uh, obviously Vancouver shouldn't have to pick up and gets passed on to us, but it does impact our budget. Uh, one area that we are being very mindful of is our legal costs. Again, because of the spinoff with the other stuff, the uh, legal costs are, are fairly high again and they're quickly racking up now. Um, the latest one was just the, the uh, letter in regards to the paid matter that we'll discuss in the, in the, in the closed meeting, but you know, it doesn't take long to rack up a couple thousand dollars in legal costs. So, you know, it's, it's again, I keep trying to play that balancing act of, you know, don't want to pay it, but pay it now or pay a much larger amount later when we don't do it properly. So again, the lesser of two evils, but unfortunately it does have an impact on the budget. So I, I think we're doing okay, considering all those factors, we should be at just a little over 41% of the budget spent to this point of the year, and we're actually at 49%. But once some of those, some of those things will normalize themselves and then we'll just have to keep an eye on some of the training costs and different things like that, that you know, we're already kind of pieced out the courses that we can cancel if it needs, you know, if we start getting into more of a budget crunch. Chief, the critical incident debriefing, what line item would that be? Uh, the first line under admin. Okay. Uh, what that at 52 percent. I see. Yeah. Service. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I wasn't clear what line item it was yeah. budgeted under, under. And then the investigation expenses. I'm hearing you say that there's a couple of reasons for that, but at least one of those reasons is kind of predictable, right? Like the increased transcriptions costs. Yep. So that that's what you mean when you say you need to have a talk with Chris. So moving forward, that needs to be better accounted for. The predict the ones that we can predict are going to be yeah. higher. Yeah. And that. Uh, some of the some of the fixed costs, well, they're fixed costs, but they're increasing fixed costs, like mm -hmm. our use of Prime and those services that you know we're we basically have to use Prime, which is our um, data data records. I can't think of the mm -hmm. acronym. The record management system is uh, you know all the police departments use it, but you know we pay for that service, and there's been some relatively large increases in that too. Um, you know, again, they're they're just those things you have no choice on, but like everything else, they just keep going up in price. So yeah, we we try and keep track of that over the over the year. We did get an increase in some of the budget for transcription and stuff this year, but you know, it only takes one or two major investigations and you could burn through that transcription budget fairly quickly too. Thank you. Okay, any other questions for the chief? Okay, the recommendation before us that the Lassen Police Board receive and accept the financial report as presented. Can I have a mover? If Lena, seconded by Lindsay, all those in favor, opposed, and that carries. Thank you. Moving on to 6B, the BC Association of Municipal Police Chiefs update. Uh, there's not much to update uh, for this meeting. The uh, the next BCA, CP, and MCP meetings are at the end of the month. Detecting. So there should be some updates next meeting. Can I just ask you how often you meet? Well, there's, there's actual in-person meetings that are three times a year. And then okay. there's, uh, well... They're, they have in-person meetings, but you can't attend virtually. Right. I'm doing that on the, this one coming up. And then generally about once a month, give or take, there's uh, okay, so there an online meeting. Meeting. Probably more like once every six weeks to two months. Okay. Moving on to 6C, community policing update. The uh, the one thing for the community policing update we have is the hiring of our community safety officer. So. She started this week. She started some in-house training and uh, just on all the different systems and reporting that she'll need to do a bunch of the uh, policy that she needs to be familiar with. Um, I think she got out on a ride along today. Did she? Yeah, I saw, I saw her. Out okay. Her, yeah. Um, we're going to start getting her to 
go with actually one of our new constables because I thought it'd be a good idea for him to get down and go meet them. Lots of the business owners, not too. So the two of them are going to go out and just go to the businesses and introduce themselves and check in. Uh, but, uh, after we talked about it, we thought it might be better to wait till she has her uniform just so everybody recognizes her so with that. Um, but we should have something fairly quick in that. And then we've got a number of tasks that she uh, will start right away with the businesses and uh, some of the people on Baker and outreach and some of that stuff. So um, I have more of an update in the speaking as well. Um, can I ask a question? And that this needs to be put in the main camera, that's fine. But just in terms of talking about uniform, we've we've heard from um, groups like the West Kootenai People for Racial Justice that um, the uniforms can be off putting or un 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 unengaging or triggering. <laughs> yeah, triggering. And so um, I realize that she needs to be identi identifiable. And I think that there's safe, personal safety reasons for the actual person as, as well, particularly if they're in a crowd or whatever. And we need to be able to identify, you know, our people in any situation. But um, what kind of uniform? will she have? Uh, well, we've tried to make it certainly identifiable as being distinct from the police because we don't want that either. Right. Um, so it'll be similar to a uniform, probably more similar to what, you know, the old police uniforms used to look like with a light blue shirt and flashes that say CSO. But she's also, we're looking into whether um, they, they do need some kind of protective vest. Um, we're doing some research into the whether it's more uh, apt to come across something with a knife incident or that, that, that we'd be looking at a edged weapon. Sorry, I'm just trying to think of the terminology for it because we looked at it. Uh, basically an edged weapon protection vest as opposed to a ballistic vest. Right. Because uh, Ballistic vests, and not to go off on too much of a tangent, but ballistic vests were more brought in because lots of officers and law enforcement stuff were actually being killed with their own firearm. Right. So mm -hmm. they were getting it away from stuff, and that's why the rationale is they have to be rated to whatever firearm you carry and one level higher usually. Um, but that doesn't stop a lot of firearms. But odds are of getting into struggle with somebody and then getting your firearm away. So obviously she's not going to have a firearm, and being on Baker and dealing with some of the vulnerable population more likely to encounter a knife incident if, you know, I'd still say that's fairly low likelihood of that happening, but more likely of that happening than encountering somebody on Baker Street with a firearm. It's going to Right. And so, I mean, it's just kind of crazy. So in the summertime, does she have like bylaw, will she have the option to wear shorts as opposed to long pants and just as long as she's got her identifying other things on so that she yeah. looks like part of the yeah. crowd. I think we've got the beat officer wears shorts downtown, yeah. so I okay. think it's the same thing. If you have her, once she has her shirt with her shoulder flashes and her vest clearly will say CSO across right. it, and, okay. and if she wants to, but some days when it's too broad. Thank you. It just, it, it seems like something that maybe isn't important, but just that, that visual can be recognizable, but not, um, not triggering. I mean, it's just that, you know, those are the discussions that we're, we're hearing by people in the community. So I think we have to be um, cognizant of those. So thanks for that, Chief. Any other questions for the Chief at this point on that? And then is there an update coming from the Nelson um, Police Foundation? Uh, the only thing there is just the, the foundation has several directors that are kind of their term is up and will be leaving. So we're looking for new directors. So um, you know, for all the people that watch this broadcast, if they uh, are interested in being on the police foundation, if they can get a hold of us, we'll put you in touch with the right people. And any idea while you're talking to the viewing audience, yeah. um, um, how many directors are on the police foundation and how often, this isn't a, a monthly meeting, is it? Uh, six directors and we kind of schedule it as needed, but I'd say probably more like quarterly as it other... works out. Every, yeah. every other month is when we're supposed to be. Supposed to be. Yeah. 
right? It always seems like it's. But we haven't met. Maybe once we have new directors too, they'll be available more. We just right now it's been hard to get meetings, so it's probably more like every three months. But okay, just so people understand that it's not a huge commitment, but say four to six times a year could be reasonable expectation. Yeah, and they're relatively short meetings. Uh, usually done half an hour, a long meeting, maybe 45 minutes. Okay, so what you're saying is that they're not chaired by the current um, uh, lease board chair. Lease board stuff. <laughs> <laughs> mm -hmm. I, I noticed that there was something out asking for police board found or police foundation um, members. Is there um, any recruitment attempts to reflect our diverse community or is that just sort of this, just sort of a general call out there? Any outreach that goes on or anything like that that you're aware of? Kind of a general call at the moment. Yeah, okay. Thank you. I think the history has been that there's some connection to the police board. There were people, my first meeting representing this board, I did not feel comfortable in that group. No? Yeah. Right away, I just felt, you know, like, Nobody talked to me, or so we need to change that. I think the uh, culture, right? Yeah, the culture, because they all knew, you know, it's nobody, you know, they didn't mean to be unfriendly. They just knew what they were about, and you know, I mean, it's like uh, the chief mentioned, it was a very, it's always very short, like there are things to do, and you know, we just go down the agenda, everything, everybody mm -hmm. just agrees to do whatever, and then the meeting's over, right. Oh, maybe they do need me. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you can be the guest chair next time. <laughs> Bring you in. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Well, let's keep our eye on that and be thinking about people in the community that we know that um, could be um, good to consider asking them to put their names forward. Because uh, the other thing is, we don't want polls to change at the next meeting. I mean, it'd be nice to be able to bring people in over a period of time, we don't want suddenly there be no directors. Um, moving on to if there's no other questions then, moving on to item seven, an update on uh, restorative justice, uh, Raj? Uh, there's not much of an update, just uh, we have five files on the go right now. Uh, four have been completed and one is in progress. And, okay, five files. And of, of those files, four are? Completed. Or completed. Yes. So you need some more files. Yes, we do. It, are, is that, would you say it's active, that files are actively being sought to do that, that the officers know about the processes and that the availability of that? And are, yeah, they're aware of it. They're it's aware been going of it. on for a while. Yeah. I think uh, there's this general decline compared to last year's st statistics. I think a lot of it just has to do with the kind of the year we've had, um, which has kind of caused a little bit of a, uh, a downward spiral in years and the number of files that are coming across, but it's starting to pick up now. So, and just to um, follow up on that, as I'm sure many of you are aware, is that uh, during the, um, we had the BC Police Board governance meeting here that Minister Farnsworth and um, Mr. Uh, Nikki Sharma were in, and so I did um, do my my pitch as chair of the um, police board to two of them. It's not not all that often that you get the solicitor general and the attorney general in the room at the same time, uh, but about uh, restorative justice and some of the directions that our restorative justice team could go to. And I did, of course, say you know there always seems to be in your in your mandates you're supposed to be doing um, these jobs and both clearly have in their mandate um, looking at restorative justice. So I did suggest to them that they could um, throw some money our way because we do have things going on and working with the court system here that we could probably be more effective in making sure that um, the people feel that there's been some kind of justice um, served when there has been um, crime. And so I will, I'm just in the process of writing my follow-up letter from that meeting and that'll be going forward just to remind them of what my, what my asks were on behalf of the city of Nelson and, and just so you know that it was around uh, 
uh, funding for the community safety officers as well as uh, some additional funding so that we could try to move into a full time look at uh, restorative uh, justice. Along with a few things around uh, uh, some new rules for for their decrim program, but in terms of specifically for the department here, those were my my asks to them. Okay, directors, any reports? We don't have. Too bad we don't have Sue here because she probably. I wonder if they've met yet to have a little summary of how. The, the, you know, the overall it'd be good to have a summary. I guess at the next meeting we can hear from her. By that time, they'll have a chance to talk about. Um, the BC meeting here, besides the people that all wanted to move here, Jane, I heard that you were a real estate agent at one point. Um, <laughs> um, but a nice right. connection with one of the uh, people down from who works for BPD, and she said she was going out to look at houses, which she did while, while she was here. And <laughs> I was singing the community's praises for sure, but uh, one of the benefits of being able to work remotely I think she she's one of those people who hardly has to go like she does a lot of remote stuff. So, yeah, no, I think that I mean, we haven't seen the report and I Sue's at it in the governance training right now, which is why she isn't here. Oh, right. Yeah. But uh, uh, I had lots of, you know, anecdotal, like good responses at the at the meeting from from people and then not just about Nelson, but about the, you know, the, the conference. Yeah. yeah. Quite good, I thought, and the uh, the other police chiefs and stuff on that side of things. Quite impressed with, you know, it was laid out nice. The, the topics were good. There was some good discussions, and then, I mean, obviously the after stuff. People always enjoy the after stuff, but it was a lot of comments about how it was pretty unique here and how much they enjoyed. You know, every night they went out, there was something unique that they didn't have anywhere else that they really enjoyed. So. On yeah, tour. yeah, on that. Well, and like, I mean, people were like totally blown back, and everybody that goes for the first time to go yeah. and see Alison Garvin's um, oh, yeah. Berlin is like, no, oh, that was something. That was yeah. amazing. Yeah. yeah, they were just like, this is a Nelson. And I'm like, yeah. How's <laughs> 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 um, So, yeah, anybody else have anything that they want to report on that they've been doing or updates or anything? Okay, and uh, chair's report. So I think you basically have now heard uh, my report um, continuing, of course, uh, which is a report that everybody wants to hear. The working with IHA um, as in where we can. I think we've got some issues around the um, leasing of of uh, the clubhouse area. I think security there has made um, a, a fairly big uh, difference. IHA finally putting in the 24 hour um, security uh, at that site. They still have some more um, work to do there. You have a relationship with the, the company, I guess, in terms of who they've hired there that they know that they're not supposed to be doing any kind of miracle work down there. If something happens, they too, like the rest of the population is supposed to call the police to ask for um, assistance with managing anything that might be uh, occurring down in that in that area, and we'll continue to work with them to see whether or not there is an appropriate uh, site for an inhalation uh, overdose prevention site um, here in Nelson, and where that might uh, might be. So that work uh, continues to go on. And any comments, if you want to make about what's going on down that end of town, I know that there's. Um, unfortunately, there continues to be overdose deaths here um, in town, and um, they're still doing. Um, there's a lot of recovery work doing. People that have had overdose that they've been able to um, intervene with. So, yeah, it's. I, I would say overall the situation's improved. I mean, the, the, it's never. It's not close to being fixed per se. Like there's still have to be the, the root cause of the issues and the root issues to deal with. But I somewhat happy that those, you know, that problem isn't concentrated in that one end of one block and all the neighbors have to be living with that and dealing with that. So uh, the problem is still 
we shouldn't be called a problem, but the issues are still there. They've just sort of been spread out and diffused throughout the community. So, you know, we still get the same or less same calls for service uh, to deal with uh, people who are sleeping in the doorways or places they shouldn't be. And some of the open drug use is still concerning to a lot of people, which I understand, but also have to realize that it's part of the decriminalization that's happened. And uh, we generally try and talk to the person, just convince them that maybe there's better places to do it. But again, whether we get another inhalation and overdose prevention site uh, somewhere or they combine the existing ones somehow with what's there uh, i think it's it, i think it's a problem that's going to have to be addressed and uh, we're still going to have to provide some kind of service along those lines at some point somewhere it's just getting that right place that balances the needs of the the people who need it with the needs of the people in the surrounding community and we will continue as a uh, city council and as Many um, communities now. I think it's. I don't think it's lost on, on uh, Minister Farnsworth or uh, Minister Sharma in regards to um, the decriminalization needs to have some kind of fence for maybe a lack of better words um, put around it in terms of um, open use. I don't. I haven't spoken to a mayor in any community that isn't highly um, concerned about the fact that open use is occurring and and that's just not appropriate because we have to consider all communities we have to consider all of the vulnerable people um, in a community and in my mind vulnerable people are also seniors and 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 children as well as um, those that have mental health and addiction problems so uh, I think they've heard that message I I know that the BC Chamber just passed at their AGM um, uh, a resolution regarding that that will get submitted through their channels to government and i know that this will definitely be front and center um trying to put some rules around uh decrim and open use when we get to the ubcm in september which is it seems like it's a long ways away but it's will soon be um upon us so and again i've followed up meetings i've asked for um, meetings with uh, both those ministers when i'm in um at, uh, in vancouver for the ubcm additional volume. So new business late items, Canadian Association of Police Governance sponsorship requests. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm sorry, I, I can't open anything. I'm trying to open my phone. I can't open anything. So if somebody's got some details of what they're asking us for. Do you want me to read the letter out? Um, sure. <laughs> yeah. On behalf of the CAP Board of Directors, I'm writing to request your support for the 34th Annual Conference of the Canadian Association of Police Governance. The conference will take place at St. John's, Newfoundland on August 16th to 18th. The theme for this year's conference is govern governance talking, conversations, streams, and deep dives. We have an amazing lineup of leading thinkers and experts from across the country who will take the stage and join a conversation that has been a long time coming. We're very excited to launch this very unique format of a conference experience. One room, one continuous conversation that flows and engages and is transmitted by live feed to those who are unable to attend. Costs for everything have risen dramatically in the last year and everyone's budgets have been touched. We are in a different situation in St. John's operating without local assistance or a host. That is why we're asking for your support. Any amount your board, commission, or organization can provide will really help us offset the cost of putting on this first great conference. Our members have shown their generosity and commitment by sponsoring coffee breaks, dinners, lunches, or simply contributing whatever their budget can manage. There are a variety of exceptional sponsorship opportunities available that have been tailored to provide a high level of recognition and visibility for your organization. We are sincerely grateful for any contributions you're able to make. We commit to making the conference experience unique and rewarding for everyone who attends. A copy of the updated conference program is attached. On behalf, we look forward to your positive reply. I wondered what we have done in the past. And I guess I do remember that. We don't typically not, not for this, right? We don't typically do this one. We yeah. always just do the BC one. Yeah. BC yeah. One. Yeah. Yeah. yeah I what, definitely. Sorry. Yeah, that's what I remembered. I wasn't sure if I remembered correctly. Yeah. I, I found that bit interesting about the fact that there is a municipal police department in St. John's, but this is where it's being held. Yeah. Interesting, because it's really expensive for everybody to get there. Exactly. And that's then, at, like you, also you're hosting something where like it's expensive for us to get there. Yeah. Um. I'm thinking that's our contribution. 
Yeah. Right. That's exactly that's what I thought. It's you know what? That's expensive. where it was going from. Yeah. This small detachment. Yeah. That's, yeah. Yeah. The um. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that seemed like an interesting choice to me. It's kind of a corporate style of even the way they, you know, if you give so much, then you get this, and if you give so much, I just recognition. You mean? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's almost advertising, right? Yes. Like, I read the whole thing, and I, it just, yeah, that's mm -hmm. kind of not how I operate. So it was like, what? Yeah. We already cost you so much to get there. Do totally. you think we're doing our part? <laughs> yeah, and if we haven't generally in the past, so yeah, this is not the year. No. So. Yeah, I'm just sort of thinking that I'm looking at, I, I'm seeing here now the, you know, you have $10,000, five minutes speaking opportunity. Yeah. Just keep, I'm sort of thinking like, um, sorry, I don't think else come out of my eyes, the NRA, I was thinking more like, uh, um, you know, Wheeland, who does all the lights and, you know, hopefully, hopefully these police, this group has reached out to all of those um, big companies that do up all the light bars and whatever on police vehicles and things right. like that, right? I mean, like, I'm sorry, I think, what what would I, I'm going to get a five minute speaking opportunity while I introduce a keynote speaker. Well, you know, <laughs> I, I could pitch move to Nelson, but um, <laughs> anyways, yeah, I think that, you know, we're such a small uh, organization that hopefully the bigger groups mm -hmm. like VPD that have depth and have strong, you know, strong unions could look at maybe having kind of some kind of, um, Sponsorship there. If there's if there is any interest um, from from you, I can um, ask Nelson Hydro. City of Nelson doesn't uh, do um, sponsorships per se, but we can through um, Nelson Hydro. I don't know. You can ask and see, but I don't see us. Okay. So. Thanks, but no thanks on 10A. Is that the general feeling I'm receiving? Okay. Do we have to give a letter back or just no response as a response? I'll, 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 email, I'll email her back. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Also, if I don't get sponsored, I'll just see a solo thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I was thinking $10,000. I was thinking $1,000 or something. Yeah, $1,000 would help. Opportunities are, are there. There's an Elson Hydro thing on their vest. Ah, yeah, sponsor yeah. it. The platinum. That's $2,000. So. <laughs> yeah. Perfect. Yeah, I think if we can just send them back a, a letter and, and uh, we're going to be there and we'll be we'll be extraordinarily loud, the team from Nelson. Huh? <laughs> okay. So item number um, 11, uh, next meeting is to be held on July. Sorry, July. In a minute. Um, at 4:30. Are you okay with that? Okay. And if I could have a motion then to adjourn the open meeting. It's been moved and seconded. All those in favor, and that carries. Okay. So I want to thank you, Storm, for coming to our to your first police board meeting. We're an exciting bunch. You didn't get to see Sue, but um, next time you will get to meet her as well. Thank you.